Well, good morning, family and friends of First United Methodist Church of Turlock. I am Pastor Steve Judson, and it is great to be with you this morning. Know that no matter who you are or where you come from, you matter to God and you matter to us. We are taking a few weeks of pausing in-person activities, including worship, and we will be online for the next four weeks uh, through the end of January. We appreciate your patience and your support and grace. This was a difficult decision with the rise in the Omicron variant cases. Uh, while the uh, Omicron variant is not as harsh, it is very transmissible, and with a large uh, community of persons uh, that are uh, more compromised in terms of uh, immunity, uh, we felt that that was a good decision on part of our church. We appreciate your, your ongoing support in every way and certainly uh, appreciate your financial support, which you can do online uh, through, the, uh, through the website, um, uh, through the mail, or in person by just giving us a call and letting us know you're stopping by. The office will be open by appointment during January uh, and just thankful for your ongoing support and again, in every way. Um, we encourage you to register this morning. Let us know you were with us. You can do that there on the website. Uh, there should be a place to let us know that you were there, and you can place uh, prayer requests and uh, provide those to us as well. Actually, my family was not going to be there in person this week anyway. Uh, we uh, came back from Ohio at the beginning of this past week, and we brought an unwelcomed guest whose name begins with C and ends with Ovid with us. <clears throat> so all of the other members of my family, the two kids that are living at home in Kiffin, are all uh, getting over their COVID, but doing well. I am negative, and so kind of secluding in an area of the house here uh, that I'm calling the sovereign territory of the COVID-free, uh, and, and trying not to uh, to get it while they uh, get over it, and with you from here in the house uh, this uh, this day. Really excited about the message series in the Lord's Prayer this month, and so grateful to be with you. Hope you will tune in or uh, show up online each uh, each Sunday um, or when you are able to participate in the worship service. Uh, and at this time, Gary Mallory, our safety team leader, is going to come and share just a little bit more <clears throat> about the decision and uh, our current status uh, with uh, uh, our in-person activities. Uh, they are due to come back at the 1st of February, and so we're hopeful and looking forward that that will indeed uh, be the case. Thank you for being here with us, and we're looking forward to a great service. May it inspire and encourage you uh, this day. Gary? Good morning. The safety committee has determined from the surge of people testing positive from the latest COVID variant, from holiday travels and gatherings, we need to pause all in-person activities through the month of January to allow for this surge of positive cases to drop off in our community and for the safety of our church family. We anticipate church activities to return to normal be beginning the 1st of February. Our worship services will be online only for the balance of the month. Youth groups will not be meeting on Sunday evenings. Please join us at 9.30 each Sunday morning or when your schedule allows for worship. Outside groups notified they could once again meet in our church and have made a reservation with our church office may hold their event. We will notify them of our church's decision and allow them to make their own choice as to whether their group should meet at the church or not. Thank you for your understanding and support during these challenging times. We all hope life will return to a normal soon. Let us go to prayer now as we begin our worship time together. Dear Lord, we know you are watching over us and will be with us as we live through this pandemic times. Our hearts reach out to you for your grace and strength. Open our minds this morning as we come closer to you and understand better the stories of the Bible and how we might learn to be better disciples of Christ. In all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
from the fall He ransomed from the fall Hail Him who saves you by His grace And crown Him Crown Him Crown Him Welcome to Children's Time. For the next four Sundays, we'll be looking a little deeper into the Lord's Prayer. Now, the Lord's Prayer is a prayer that Jesus taught his first disciples to pray, and we continue to pray it today. But what does it mean, and what are we saying when we say this prayer? So let's start with the first line. It says, Our Father. So two things stick out to me here. And the first is that it says our, not my. So that means we are to be praying as a community or a group and that God is for everyone and we need to pray for one another. And the next word is father. And that's another word for God, but it's an affectionate word and it's welcoming and it's showing us that God loves all of us as his children. Now, this is the part where it gets a little confusing. Who art in heaven. So is God in heaven working on some art projects? Well, maybe, but what's important to know is that the word art um, in olden times used to mean is. So basically it's just saying that God is in heaven. And you may be asking, well, what is heaven? Well, the Bible describes heaven in the Bible as where all the stars and the planets and the galaxies are. And it's a place where people go to be with God after they die. It's a place of joy and peace and love. So this tells us that God is all around us and is near to us always. So the last part of the line says, hallowed be thy name. Hallow is another old word that means holy or something awesome and very special and good. So when we think of God and when we use his name, we are saying that he is awesome and good. So let's put this first line together and start to figure out what we're saying in this prayer. So it basically means that we are praying for all of those around us to our Father God who is near and who is amazing and good. And we'll start with the next line next week. So let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for your son, Jesus who taught us how to pray, and may we find comfort in knowing you are our Father and with us always. Amen. Jesus, 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 there's just something
Our scripture is from Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. Pray, therefore, in this manner. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven. Yes? Don't interrupt me, I'm praying. But you called me. Called you? No, I didn't call you. I'm praying. Our Father, who art in heaven. There, you did it again. Did what? Called me. You said, Our Father, who art in heaven. Well, here I am. What's on your mind? But I didn't mean anything by it. I was... You know, just saying my prayers for the day. I always say the Lord's Prayer. It makes me feel good, kind of like fulfilling a duty. Well, all right, go on. Okay. Hallowed be thy name. Hold it right there. What do you mean by that? By what? By hallowed be thy name. It means, it means... Oh, good grief. I don't know what it means. How in the world should I know? It's just a prayer. By the way, what does it mean? It means honored, holy, wonderful. Oh, that makes sense. I never thought about what Hallowed meant before. Thanks. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Do you really mean that? Well, sure. Why not? What are you doing about it? Doing? Why, nothing, I guess. I just think it would be kind of neat if you got control of everything down here like you have up there. We're kind of in a mess down here, you know. Yes, I do know. But have I got control of you? Well, I go to church. That isn't what I asked you. What about your bad temper? You've really got a problem there. And all those people who are homeless and hungry, what are you doing to help them? Now, hold on just a minute. Stop picking on me. I'm just as good as the rest of those people at church. Excuse me. I thought you were praying for my will to be done on earth like it is up here in heaven. If that is ever to happen, it will have to start with those who are praying for it, like you, for example. Oh, all right. I guess I do have some hang-ups and 
There are things I don't do that I probably should. Now that I think about it, I could probably name some other things I could do better. So could I. I guess I really don't think about it much, but I really would like to do better, you know, to help bring your will and ways to earth like it is up there. Good. Now we're getting somewhere. We'll work together, you and me. I'm proud of you. Look, God, if you don't mind, I really need to finish up down here. This is taking a lot longer than it usually does. Give us this day our daily bread. Okay, I will. I will give you everything you need to get through this day. Oh, okay, great. That was easier. What are you waiting for? I'm scared to keep going. Scared? Of what? I know what you're going to say. Try me. Okay. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. What about Anne? See, I knew it. I knew you would bring her up. Oh, come on, God. She's told lies about me. She spreads stories. She owes me money. I've sworn to get even with her. But your prayer, what about your prayer? I didn't mean it. Well, at least you're honest. But it's quite a load carrying around all that bitterness and resentment, isn't it? Yes, but I'll feel better as soon as I get even with her. She'll wish she'd never been born. No, you won't feel any better. You'll feel worse. Revenge isn't sweet. You know how unhappy you are, but I can change that. You can? How? Forgive Anne, then I'll forgive you. And the sin of hatred you're carrying around will be Anne's problem, not yours. In fact, you might even pray for Anne. She has alienated some other people too, and she isn't happy either. Oh, I hadn't really thought about that. Okay, you know you're right, you always are. And even more than I want revenge anyway, I want your blessing and love. All right, I forgive her. There now, wonderful. How do you feel? Hmm, well, not bad. Not bad at all. In fact, I feel pretty great. In fact, I don't think I'll go to bed feeling uptight tonight. I haven't been getting much rest, you know. Yes, I know. But you're not through with your prayer, are you? Go on. Oh, that's right. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Yes, I can do that. Of course, you do have to try and not put yourself in situations where you might be tempted. Sometimes people get themselves in a bind and end up needing some help from me up here when they could have avoided it if they had stayed away from the situation in the first place. I think you know what I mean. Yes, I know. Okay, go ahead and finish your prayer then. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Do you know what would bring me glory? What would really make me happy? No, but I'd like to know. I really do want to please you. I want to follow you faithfully and be a part of sharing your love and hope with others. It would be really great if I could do that all the time. I just want to make this world a better place, more like it is up there. So tell me, how do I make you happy? You just did.
Most of us have probably seen Leonardo da Vinci's famous painting, The Mona Lisa, perhaps many times on TV, the internet, in books. Perhaps a few have even seen it displayed at the Louvre, the museum in Paris, France, uh, where it is displayed. It is believed to have been painted somewhere between 1503 and 1506 and been on permanent display at the Louvre since 1797. A recent curator of the museum once commented on the painting. He said the woman is not particularly beautiful and there's not a lot of color in the painting. In fact, there's not that much to see. Yet it is perhaps the most famous painting in the world. The problem, he said, is that she has become so famous that we really don't see her anymore. What would be extraordinary, he said, would be to see the Mona Lisa for the very first time as if you had never seen her before. Well, I think the same thing could be said about the Lord's Prayer, except, of course, that the Lord's Prayer is colorful and beautiful in the way that it flows. Most of us here at First UMC know it by heart because we recite it. We pray it every week during the worship service. Many of us have prayed it probably hundreds or maybe even a thousand times or more during our lives. And yet in the same way that it's easy to take even our relationship with God for granted, there can be a tendency to say this prayer and to take it for granted. To say the words without fully understanding what we're saying when we pray it and therefore fail to experience its greatest impact in our lives. What would be extraordinary is if we could pray it as if for the very first time, as if we had never heard it before, for it to become as meaningful to us as to the disciples when Jesus first spoke those words nearly 2,000 years ago. Well, I'm not sure I can make it that fresh, but it certainly is my hope and prayer that over these next few weeks, as we examine the Lord's Prayer together, that we might experience this prayer that Jesus taught his followers to pray in a deeper and more powerful way, to pray it like we've never prayed it before. And this morning, as we begin our journey with the Lord's Prayer, I invite us to take a closer look at just the first 10 words of it. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Now, the very first word of the Lord's Prayer is probably not even given a second thought. Yet I believe this word, our, is much more important than we might ever imagine. Jesus did not tell his followers to pray my father, but our father. Many Christian songs and, and hymns use the words I and me almost exclusively. While not surprising in a very individualistic society, that's not really the way God designed it. There are no lone rangers when it comes to being Christians. As sisters and brothers in Christ, we are in this together. Our success or failure as the people of God in bringing God's hopes and dreams to pass in this world as it is in heaven is contingent upon how well we live out our faith corporately, communally. Christianity is, by and large, a communal religion. We don't sit around all day and privately contemplate the world as some Eastern religions do. Hopefully, we do have a regular time of personal devotions and prayer, preferably each day, but most of our Christian faith is lived out in community. We come together to worship, to study, to serve, and to fellowship, just to be with each other. We come together to celebrate each other's accomplishments and to support, encourage, and pray for one another when those among us are hurting or facing tough times. We hold each other accountable in some sense as we challenge each other to live the lives God has called us to live. Even accepting God's gift of forgiveness for sin and becoming a Christian, which we often think of as kind of a personal or individual decision, is often affirmed within the context of the community of faith. At church, at a youth retreat, at camp, on a mission trip, or perhaps a Sunday school class or confirmation class or, or Bible study. And it's almost always the community then that helps people begin to understand what it looks like to actually live the Christian life, 
to figure out what it actually looks like to be a faithful follower of Jesus. Now, in the Old Testament of the Bible, uh, in ancient Israel, God's blessing, or lack thereof, was dependent upon the nation's commitment to God as a whole. Now, for the disciples, Jesus' closest followers, it was about the community, that group of friends, sticking together and following Jesus around wherever he went. And later in the New Testament, after Jesus was no longer here in person, Paul spoke again and again about the importance of the community in helping individual Christians effectively live out God's calling upon their lives. To make the Christian life into some sort of personal journey between me and God or me and Jesus without connecting regularly with others in the faith community is to miss the Bible's strong emphasis on community. When you pray, Jesus said, pray our Father who art in heaven. And when we pray our Father, we are reminded that God is both deeply loving, like an earthly daddy out to be, and strong and powerful, especially given the authority fathers typically carried in the biblical times. Sometimes we in the United Methodist Church are a little cautious about too many references to God as Father, out of a genuine, a sincere, and I believe a legitimate concern for those who have had a bad experience with their earthly father. I used to kind of downplay this, to, to be honest, until I had a couple conversations with people who personally had wrestled with the concept of a relationship with God because of this idea of God as Heavenly Father and due to their own experience with a pretty abusive earthly father. But there is something very powerful to understanding God as a loving father, the perfect example of an earthly father who is always there waiting for us with arms wide open, deeply desiring that we draw closer so that, that he can hug us and, and love on us, just like a loving earthly father or mother, for that matter, would typically do with their children. It's also a powerful example of the kind of father all of us who are earthly fathers should seek to be. Even when understanding the concept of discipline and redirection, God, our loving Father, always does so out of a genuine concern for our well-being and ability to extend God's love and message of hope in Christ uh, to others. And when we pray, Our Father who art in heaven, we are acknowledging that we're not praying to just any father, to not just to anyone here, but to God, our heavenly father, the father of fathers, you might say, who art or who is in heaven is not simply placed here to indicate where God is. It's not about giving us God's location, because after all, God is spirit and just as much right here with us on earth uh, as anywhere else. So pointing out that God is our father in heaven is more a reminder of who it is that we are actually coming before when we pray. Throughout most of human history, husbands and fathers had almost unlimited authority in the household and often abused it, including in the biblical times, which is a part of the reason for the hesitancy by some to use father references with respect to God. That's why we find teachings in the New Testament, like fathers don't provoke your children to anger, but instead raise them up, teaching them about the Lord. And husbands, love your wives as your own body. And even husbands, love your wives the way Christ loves the church. If we husbands and fathers really took to heart those teachings, there wouldn't be any men running around their home acting like God had died and left them in charge. Personally, I see the relationship in the home as kind of an equal partnership between each spouse, where God invites us to be mutually submissive to one another, fully submissive to him, and working together to lead the home. And of course, most of us married men know that we wouldn't be much of a husband or father without a loving spouse, without a loving partner joining us, working side by side, sharing the joys 
and burdens of raising a family. Personally, and I'm drifting here just a little, but I'll get back on track in a moment. I think that's why single parenting is so difficult. Not because that single mother or father is any less qualified or capable of raising a family as anyone else. It's just that there's only one set of shoulders to carry all the weight, all the challenges that raising a family brings. I also happen to believe that's why the church, as we, and not me, as a community, uh, can make a huge difference in our modern world when we walk with single parents, not in a demeaning way, but supporting them and their families as our own. Yes, God, our Father, is the perfect Father who loves us deeply. And God is also our Father who art in heaven, the one and only God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And the Lord's Prayer teaches us to approach God with both the love and intimacy God desires and the respect and honor God deserves. Now, the last phrase of this first part of the Lord's Prayer is, Hallowed be thy name, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name or your name. But what in the world does hallowed mean anyway? Well, have you ever walked through the halls of a great college or university, maybe toured some of the key historical buildings in our nation's capital, or perhaps been to a great Memorial like the Vietnam Veterans Wall or the Battleship USS Arizona Memorial at Pearl Harbor. And you get goosebumps. You you can't quite explain why, but there's just something about the place that is so incredibly powerful and overwhelming. It fills you with a sense of awe, a sense that you are someplace special, perhaps even someplace sacred or holy. In those times, you might say that you are standing on hallowed ground. In the New Testament, the Greek word that is translated hallowed is only used in the Lord's Prayer. Nowhere else in the New Testament. And in the Old Testament, the equivalent Hebrew word for hallow or hallowed referred specifically to items and places that were considered sacred or holy because of their relationship to God. So the point is that to hallow the name of God means to consider it sacred, holy, or set apart. To place the name of God above every other name in heaven or on earth. And perhaps even more importantly, to come before God as if coming into the presence of a sacred and holy place. The first time that I saw the Grand Canyon in person, I took a lot of pictures. But when I got home and looked at them, they just didn't seem to do justice to the Grand Canyon and to what I felt while I was standing there at the edge of it. When I first walked up to the edge, I was immediately filled with this overwhelming sense of awe, almost stunned at how incredible it was to gaze for miles and miles in both directions. For a few moments, it was almost debilitating, so amazing that it was literally hard for me to move. And at first, I didn't want to move because I wanted to hold on to that initial feeling of awe and inspiration forever. Of course, the moment gradually faded, and I moved on. But what an incredible moment that was when I first saw that panoramic view. I've had similar experiences at Niagara Falls, peering over the edge whenever I see the ocean, and at Mount Rainier in Washington State. More recently, seeing huge redwoods and sequoias here in California gave me a similar feeling. When I read that first phrase of the Lord's Prayer, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It reminds me that when we come into the presence of God, it should be like that first glance over the Grand Canyon, or maybe the first time that you fly 
on a rainy or overcast day. You know, the moment you break through the gray into the bright blue sky and the sun shining down on the tops of all those big, white, puffy clouds. It's exciting. It's exhilarating. I believe that praying the Lord's Prayer with the excitement and passion as if for the very first time will fill us with wonder and amazement as God draws close to us and touches our lives. I believe that when we realize as Christians that we have a heavenly father, a creator and sustainer, far superior to any earthly dad who dearly loves us and isn't just in heaven, but is right here with us and residing in us through the Holy Spirit, God's presence, and who loves us and craves our presence like a loving earthly dad or mom who deeply enjoys that precious time together with their kids. It ought to just draw us to pull us toward God, to fill us with the desire to be near God, to draw close into God's presence. Like a young child who gets excited when dad or mom comes home from work and runs up to them and wraps their arms around their legs, that's the kind of excitement and joy that God wants us to experience in his presence. And I believe that the Lord's Prayer has the potential to fill us with that kind of excitement and joy if we, every time we pray, picture ourselves as coming into the literal presence of God with open arms and receptive hearts. When is the last time you were filled with awe at the realization of God's love for you? When is the last time that you approached God with an intense excitement and anticipation that something good was going to happen simply because you were in the presence of God? When was the last time that you spent time in prayer or study or worship or, or even service to others and you were awe, awed and inspired by God's love and grace and, and presence and just felt privileged and honored to be able to experience it and to be there? In the first 10 words of the Lord's Prayer, Jesus teaches us that we are family. We are in this together. Jesus teaches us that the God who is deserving of our deep respect also loves us dearly, welcomes us with open arms, and passionately wants to draw close to us. And Jesus teaches us through the Lord's Prayer how we are to come before God with both awe, and anticipation that something good is coming just because we are there. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Since I am recording at the house this morning and not over at the church due to my family getting over COVID, I thought that I would have our prayer time this morning outside overlooking the orange tree, which is getting ready and already beginning to share its fruit with us. Um, as we lift up our prayers to God this morning, uh, may we find time to lift up those prayer requests that are in our own hearts and minds um, as we come before God. And I invite us to do so now. Dear God, we thank you for your presence with us always. We thank you uh, that in easy places and in challenging places, we can know um, that you are with us. We pray for those who are uh, dealing with uh, issues related to the pandemic. We pray for those who may have health situations or be uh, dealing with uh, sickness and illness. Uh, we pray, Lord, for protection uh, for those persons. We pray, Lord, for our church as we continue to seek to honor you and share your love in the light of Christ with our community, uh, even in the midst of uh, these uh, pretty challenging uh, times. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to be creative as a church in how we do that. Lord, uh, we pray that the light of Christ that has shined, has shown in this place for uh, many, 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 many years would continue to emanate out into our community and world 
uh, that uh, First United Methodist Church of Turlock might be a haven where people not only come to know you in a personal way, dear God, um, but come to become a part of a community uh, that loves you and loves our world in the name of Jesus. Uh, dear God, we um, uh, ask that you would be with us uh, during this uh, season of digging deeper into the Lord's Prayer, this prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. And Lord, may it come alive in new and fresh ways as we do so, and even as we pray it now. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. for being present at First United Methodist Church this morning, whether in person or online. Uh, may you experience God's grace and God's love each and every day, not only in the midst of the challenging times that we find ourselves now, uh, but in the future when, by God's grace, we believe we will be past them. But even as you go out into the world this week, know that the God who loves you who wraps his arms around you and always seeks to draw you close, goes with you. And so we do not fear. We have confidence and courage because the God of all creation resides with us and in us as we seek to live out God's hopes and dreams for our world. Today, this week, and always, go now in peace and that confidence. Amen.